all of us, each and every one of us in this room wants to be traveling more sustainably. But we also are very aware that the cost of living has gone up and that's uh, hurting everyone's hip pocket. So um, perhaps the airport is a good place to start. It's where most of us, you know, hopefully start that nice holiday or that business trip that we're about to go on. Um, uh, Gerald, perhaps, you know, from Changi Airport's point of view, I mean, how is the airport cultivating more of a sustainable travel experience against that cost of living crisis? Okay. I think, um, first off, it's a, it's a good segue from the first panel and very glad that we actually talk about sustainable aviation fuel because we just finished an entire year of um, collaboration with Singapore Airlines, Scoot, and of course our aviation uh, regulator as well to trial SAF at Changi Airport. The trial has been going very successfully, no hiccups at all. and. Actually, a few other airlines have also trialled uh, on selected flights in and out of Changi Airport. So Cathay Pacific, China Airlines, amongst other airlines, have also trialled SAF. So glad actually to share with the audience here that Changi Airport is SAF ready. So ready for airlines who are ready to upload SAF on a commercial basis at Changi Airport. I think in terms of the passenger journey, one thing that uh, we've always tried very hard at Changi Airport is to make travel Changi Airport part of a very unique travel experience. We hope that once you enter Changi Airport, literally in your minds, of course, physically you leave the airport, but physically in your minds, your mind never leaves Changi Airport. So we work very hard with our airport partners. Uh, there are about 50,000 people across different airport agencies and companies working at Changi Airport. Uh, what we do is we do little steps here and there to gradually transform the passenger experience to a more sustainable one. So right from the moment when you enter the passenger terminal, there are certain elements in the terminal and jewel which actually carry a past, a history. So for instance, jewel, you actually the furnishings, uh, the benches, they're actually made of recycled rain freeze that is repurposed from the old car park, uh, which is the site of which jewel is built on. The same for our terminal buildings as well, a certain part of our pillars, actually we reuse the wood in the pillars, uh, we repurpose them into art pieces, into, into cladding for pillars as well to extend the lifespan of these materials. Uh, in terms of passenger comfort as well, we do know that there's a lot of uh, variations in terms of temperature and um, I'm, I'm sure all of us experienced a bit of heat wave recently, um, whether, uh, wherever you come from uh, in different parts of the world, we try to ensure that our air conditioning is optimized for passengers. At the same time, whenever there's uh, rain events or when the temperature goes down, we will, ahead of time, try our best to tune down, uh, tune up rather, the temperatures such that we, we uh, obtain energy savings at the same time, making sure that passengers continue to be very comfortable. A case in point for Terminal 2, uh, which was recently refurbished, the energy savings that we have achieved is about over 30%. And another aspect of uh, Changi Airport is I'm sure you have encountered also the number of trees and greenery. Uh, I was just asking my colleagues recently, a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that there are over 2 million trees and plants uh, across the terminal buildings. And that is, and it's all across the world, from South America, from Australia, from Europe, uh, and Southeast Asia region as well. And this is really to give the, a luxurious feeling when you're in the terminal, um, a relaxed feeling as well that you're in the rainforest. Um, in terms of even on the hard side of things, so apart from SAF, um, the vehicles operating on the air side of the terminal buildings, we have also gradually transitioned them to electric variants and cleaner energy variants. So all the baggage tractors that go in and out uh, of the baggage sortation areas and to the aircraft, all of these are now electrified. It's not only helpful in terms of uh, the environment, it also helps our airside workers because uh, they have reported that in terms of their health and safety, um, they are very pleased with this. Um, we are going forward with, to electrify more of our vehicles on the air side. So this is maybe just snippets of what we're doing to transform the whole uh, passenger journey.
And Changi Airport is certainly, you know, always winning awards for that sort of thing. And this is something that passengers just get to experience when they're coming through Changi Airport. But I suppose the next stop of their journey is often the, the hotels, um, Jeremy. And perhaps, you know, this is where passengers get to, or, you know, people get to exercise a little bit more say. They might drop their towels on the bathroom floor, even though there's always that sign saying, please hang them up if you want to reuse them. They might actually want the little packages because they take them home and they keep them as souvenirs. So how does the Pan Pacific Group, Pan Pacific Group rather, um, kind of deal with this? Uh, you know, you can't control what, what people do in a hotel room, but you still want to make your properties and your offering as green as possible. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good question. I think most hotel companies today have uh, sustainability programs. Um, you've probably been in hotels where, uh, like, um, they have uh, reusable towels, so rather than getting your towels uh, changed every day and your sheets, you can make that choice. So that's putting it back into the hands of the consumer to make those choices themselves. I think um, uh, Pan Pacific Hotels Group uh, has made a very bold decision um, in actually creating a brand that revolves around sustainability. So within the group, um, we have Pan Pacific, uh, which is our five-star uh, luxury brand. We have our Park Royal um, brand, which is um, based around uh, local communities and uh, engagement with uh, local cultures. So um, if you have a look at the two um, Park Royal hotels here in Singapore, we have one on Beach Road um, and we have one in Kitchener uh, near Little India. So they're you know, really integrated with the local community. And then we have our Park Royal Collection uh, brand, which is uh, based all around sustainability. So that's a bold step. You say, okay, so why, how do you make a brand completely around sustainability? And uh, it takes a lot of commitment because it's not just about activating uh, sustainable practices, which is what everyone else is doing. Um, it's actually about um, creating a brand that uh, has biophilic design. So even before you build the building, you have to be thinking about uh, what destination you're creating, what is it that's going to attract uh, people to come and stay at your hotel versus uh, other hotels. So, for example, I'm not sure if you're familiar with our uh, Park Royal Collection Pickering, but uh, this was built over 13 years ago, uh, designed by Woha. And um, a biophilic design basically means uh, making that connectivity between nature um, and uh, the building uh, more uh, connected so that people feel like um, they're more closer to nature. So you have that sort of more uh, zen feeling when you come into a space, it's more relaxing. Um, and so when they designed that hotel, uh, you, when you approach it from the outset, you'll notice that they have these beautiful uh, gardens that flow down the side of the building. It's like an inverted uh, a rice paddy terrace. Um, and uh, this actually, the gardens on the side of the building uh, actually 15,000 square metres of a lush tropical garden, which is two times the footprint of the, of the building that it sits on. So you can imagine if you were going to say, OK, I want to make a statement with, um, uh, with uh, making sure that I'm being uh, conscious of the environment, it would be two of those city blocks next to each other, which would just be park. Uh, that's the amount of uh, lush gardens on the outside. It's not just aesthetically um, beneficial, but also um, that garden actually keeps the building cool. So, um, you know, we have uh, lower temperatures, which means less air conditioning. Uh, we're physically changing the environment of the hotel for that space. That, that garden is actually um, fully self-sufficient. So um, we have uh, new water that we use to, um, to irrigate the garden. Uh, as well as collected water. So we have uh, collection um, uh, drains that uh, form in a tank on the 10th floor um, and irrigate all of the plants so it's fully self-sufficient. Um, not only that, in the design of the building they have smart glass uh, which uh, all of the uh, glass panes throughout the building are um, helping to reduce UV light and solar, reducing the um, internal temperature of the building by 2%. Again, uh, just making sure that we are using uh, less energy. Um, they have um, all of the uh, corridors that uh, lead to the guest rooms and the public spaces are actually outdoor. 
So they've been designed to uh, ventilate the space to keep it cool, even so it's out, outdoors, but then also reducing that amount of space that we have to air condition. And, and hopefully, you know, staying in, in a building like this also makes travellers more conscious of, of their own actions as well. You know, they're not going to dump the towels on the, on the floor as much as they, as they might when they're surrounded by all of this, this, well, this goodness. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's an experience. You, you, it's an iconic building. Yes. Um, it's probably one of the most Instagrammable hotels mm. in the city other than perhaps a Marina Bay Sands for different reasons. Um, but people will go there because they recognize uh, what this uh, brand stands for. But it's also the experiences that they have um, in the building. So you can go uh, to the top floor um, and there's an urban garden there. So uh, basically we farm uh, fruit and vegetables and herbs and we actually take a farm to the table within the building. Literally. Um, and incorporate <laughs> that into the menus uh, uh, in the hotel. So. It's really experiential. Uh, it's not just making a statement. It's not just your choice. Um, but when you stay in that a place, it's a destination. You'll choose to go there because of the, the building and the way it's being designed. So, so sorry. Mm. I was just going to say, Jason, from um, a tour operator's point of view, um, how are you pro approaching the concept of sustainable travel? So for the um, tour operator's uh, point of view, it's a drop in the ocean compared to hotels and airports and stuff like sure. that. Um, I think it's very nascent. Uh, not a lot of companies are doing it, and I think partly that's driven by the demands of the customer, if there is any at all. Um, but for um, the way I look at it was, how does sustainable travel, responsible travel, uh, uh, apply to the tour operator industry, especially for, for companies that are based here or in Southeast Asia or Asia, right? So for Singapore's context, the way I looked at it was that um, there are all these like pillars of um, sustain what's the city sustainable travel. But for, for me, the way I distill it was that um, there is the awareness bit. So what's the story you want to tell? That's the premise of the tour. Like, What do people want to... So for this part of the world, uh, it's very unique. Um, would probably be food wastage, themes like that, that would be appeal because that's a big drive towards reducing food wastage. And the second one um, could be about water sustainability, which Singapore does really well at. So it's the content, it's the three pillars, right? So it's a content, so awareness, that's how you choose, because we can't be talking about rainforest when we don't have any in here, right? I mean, Jewel's a good example of kind of a pseudo rainforest, but you, you, know, you know what I mean. So it has to be applied to this part of the world in Singapore. And the second, obviously, is the impact of communities and also um, inclusivity. So what's the impact? A lot of corporates now are coming to us. Well, not a lot, but last year we start getting the early shoots where people are saying, I no longer just want to do a day one, just a tour. I want to do something that, um, give me a tour, a normal tour of Changi Airport or whatever, or Gardens by the Bay, but uh, for day two, give me something that has meaning, like I can contribute to society. So two communities that um, I think that uh, we sort of serve in a way is, um, let's say, for example, we talk about food wastage. It could be corporate saying that um, in the morning half we do this tour, but can we do something about food wastage? So hotels, buffets, you know, like um, after a certain time they throw away the food, but there's this kind of an hour between two to three that food's still okay to be eaten. So rather than waste it, uh, corporate saying, could we mobilize our entire corporate uh, team and, mo and pack that into bento boxes and give it out to uh, families that need it, right? yeah. So these are things that have real impact. Nobody wants to sit and listen to water system like a download. They want to do something. So there are companies that are saying, don't just give me a one day tour, give me something else. Give me something that my team can do. So that's the social aspect. And of course, the, environment ex uh, the environmental aspect is a drop in the ocean compared to, so the only thing we can do is things like, um, let's say for example, the use of electric vehicles. And again, that is really much driven by what the customer is telling us. If the customer is saying, we absolutely insist on having that, then of course, um, we would go to our trans transport operators and tell them that this has to, be, this has to happen. But uh, arguably, economies of scale uh, matters there. So I think more of that would move the needle if it's from corporates as opposed to the FIT free and independent traveler. I'm interested in, uh, you know, talking about what the consumer wants, and I'd be curious in, as to your views. Post-COVID, do you think, um, you know, the pandemic has made us as individual travellers more conscious of sustainability, or are we greedier in terms of, you know, revenge travel? We, we're out 
to, you know, do our once in a lifetime trip, greenness sort of be damned. What, what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah. I can take that. Uh, I, th I think um, the revenge travel bit, if you think about it from a consumer point of view, yeah, you're more aware, but at the same time, counter to COVID, you were more using things that are individu individually packed. So you want your own this, your own that, and that kind of kind of counters the, you know what I mean, the environment aspect. So I think uh, while there is that social consciousness to be a bit more um, thinking of society and being aware, there, there's also that bit where, where do you draw the line? Because um, the cost of things matter. And also um, there was, remember the first part of travel when we started, everything was all like, there a lot more packaging you see and things like that. So it's, it's, it's consciousness, yes, but, but yeah, yeah, but it counters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think to me, um, COVID was really a time of reflection, reflection for a lot of people. You reflect about your, how you go about your daily life, how you work even. So now there's a hybrid work arrangements as well, even the way you travel. And we do see a shift. I think although leisure travel is coming back, consumers, so I'll talk about leisure and business travel. So for leisure travel, uh, we do realize that travelers are a lot more conscious about the sustainable impact of traveling. Uh, beyond just environmental impact, I think they're looking at a holistic way of traveling such that the countries that they go to and they travel to, they try their best, definitely not to damage or harm the communities there, but ideally to also benefit the communities that they travel to. So and that's how we, we also try to reinvent ourselves uh, for Changi Airport because we we do note that we are conduit for which uh, travellers either come into Singapore or leave Singapore or um, a good portion of our travellers are also transit and transfer travellers. So we do implant sustainability messages in our advertising uh, throughout our shops, um, even in common areas. So we do have uh, publicity campaigns as well for travellers. That's one part of it. Uh, for business travellers, so again, I, I believe all the online platforms, um, all of us I'm sure have had tons of online meetings. Um, I believe now there's a prioritization or only when you do believe um, that there's a real need to travel as, as corporates, then you do travel. And for that, uh, we are, it's in the works right now, but we are actually trying to see how we can enable corporates to travel more sustainably. So by this, I mean offsets. Um, we are looking seriously at the possibility of offsets as well for both corporate and individual travellers. Jeremy, do you think the COVID pandemic has made people more willing to travel sustainably or more selfish? That's a very good question. Um, I think uh, pre-COVID, definitely uh, there was excess. Um, you had very inexpensive airline tickets. People could travel rather than once or twice a year, maybe three times or even four times. Um, and so it was, you know, visiting uh, destinations, um, spending a lot of money and sort of having that excess because things were so readily available. I think obviously during COVID, everyone was held back. Um, they were in their homes. Um, the biggest trip they could make would be a, a local hotel for a weekend a staycation, um, which was the catchphrase for quite a few years if, that, if they were able to. I think what people are looking for now, obviously they're more prudent. Um, they're taking maybe one or two trips a year maximum. Um, obviously the costs of things has escalated, there's inflation, the high cost of uh, hotels, the high cost of uh, tickets. So uh, yeah, definitely I think um, they are thinking sustainably, they're experience, they're, they're planning their trips to destinations which is safer. Um, they're gonna be experiential destinations, they're gonna be planning and looking at where they're gonna be staying. Um, and making those choices that are personal choices. And I think for those people who are conscious of sustainability, um, then definitely the location, the hotel that they choose um, is going to be one uh, that they're really focused on. And so, you know, we, we find that people now, um, when they come to hotels, there's certain expectations. And we see it in the guest comments uh, that they post online. Um, and they'll make comments uh, if, towels are collected uh, when they've asked for them not to be as opposed to the other way around. Um, so I definitely think the whole world has moved forward. Um, there's a broader understanding of sustainability. There's a, a level of consciousness about sustainability. Um, and, and I think that it, that's been um, 
exacerbated through COVID and people are now more aware of costs and expenditure, but also the cost of the environment. At least there's some good things that have come out of COVID. Look, I think on that note, we are out of time. So um, thank you, gentlemen, all very much for your time. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you.